and is the perfect view of the royal family, or at least two of the three members of the royal family. Well done, Kurula. You clever girl. You can see her canine starting to yellow, starting to age a little bit. She is turning 13 in a couple of months. But I think that age has just given her even more in terms of experience and ability with her cubs. And we're not just saying that because we love her, because we do, of course, but it's actually because it's borne out. The evidence is right here in front of us. Trungile is nearly, nearly at that 12-month stage where a leopard survival rate very rapidly increases, especially for a female. Um, once she hits sexual maturity, she's going to be, in terms of the biggest threats, she's going to be out of the woods. <laughs> James is pulling faces at me. <laughs> Michael, he wants to know what part of her territory Karula might give Shungile. It's impossible for us to predict, and it's, it's always a little bit more complex in practice. Um, you might find that Shungile moves, she could actually even move away from her mom totally, although she probably won't. Um, she could move up into the northern section of her territory. It's impossible for us to tell. My guess would be that it, Shungile, because we don't know exactly how that process works and how much of a role the the daughters actually play in the choice as well. It might be that Shungile might decide to stay in an area that's very familiar to her, which would be south of the Gauri Main and around Treehouse Dam. That's base, That's one of the, the areas that we found Shungile in the most. Or it might be that she goes up further to the north into Buffelshook because with the death of Shuluva, they will be a little bit, well, I don't think it's, I actually don't think the vacuum's going to last for too long. Do not catch a spider, hunt, spider hunting wasp, little girl. That will be a mistake that you will not ever repeat. They sting hard. <laughs> Look at her, she's so funny. She's so hot and she's so tired. But she wants to just go back and carry on playing with her impala. To me, she looks more like Tundi than she looks like Karula, actually. What you seen? What have you seen? Oh no. <laughs> it's on the other side of the termite mound. Don't disappear, Shungile. Oh, Karula. A Karula is one of the leopards where, when I was first told that she had a wow, or the word wow on her forehead, I, um, I wasn't fully convinced. I thought it would have to take a little bit of a stretch of the imagination to see it. But when she looks straight, on, straight at us like that, it really, I don't know, I can see the word wow very clearly between her eyes. Hosanna looks a bit more like mom than Shungile does. <laughs> Although since Shungile's eyes have gone a bit bluer, perhaps a bit more so. What have you seen? What's there, girl? She's looking at something. Oh, it's the, it's the impala. She's seen an impala. How's that intent gaze? From restful to fiercely concentrated. And the impala is aware, unfortunately I can't, if I reposition now, um, I'm going to make life very difficult. The but to describe it to you, the impala is about a hundred and fifty meters directly behind me. So she's looking just past the car at the impala. And the impala is aware of something, but I think it's actually more that it's aware of us. So it's just seeing what we're doing, but it hasn't actually seen the leopard. So I don't think this is the female that was looking for its baby earlier. I think it's a herd that stumbled through. 
It could be, though. It could be that female looking for its baby. She might have moved. It's not uncommon for grieving mothers, um, in terms of antelope or zebra, to get killed themselves. It often happens that way. They're trying desperately to search for their offspring in the hope that they're alive still, and they get caught. It does happen. You can just see the, the wheels turning in Karula's head. The impala's moving off. Is she thinking about whether or not it's worth trying to hunt them? Or would she really rather just not be bothered? Are they just too far away? Leopards are opportunists, so if they were closer, if an if a impala herd stumbled through here in close enough proximity to her, she would go for it. She absolutely would. We've seen um, Tandy with three impala kills. Now, Jen B wanted to know if perhaps um, Karula, in the spirit of Christmas, caught a lamb for each of them, and perhaps Hosane is with his. Maybe. I can't discount it as a possibility, but I doubt it. You don't really see cubs being given separate kills and then feeding on their own. At least we've never seen it, especially not with this particular family. What's always happened is Karula's made a kill, she's bought the cubs and they've taken turns to feed. Um, sometimes she has made a kill, she's made two kills. Um, we've seen that a few times within relatively close proximity of each other, like for example the Dacre and then the Impala in the drainage line, <coughs> excuse me, where Karula they all stopped to feed on the Impala first, and then they went and all fed on the Dacre together. So I doubt it, Jen, but I can't discount it. I can't discount it as a possibility. She's so close to quarantine. I can't believe it. She must have been here the whole time. Blinking laconically at us. And welcome to Lucy again. Thank you for sending through your question, Lucy, or sending through another question. Lucy, you want to know how strong family ties are in the animal kingdom. Sorry, let's just see what this little monkey's up to. It depends on the animal. Um, family ties between elephants, particularly female elephants, are unbelievably strong, um, as are the family ties between lionesses. So female lions are strong and actually life-lasting. They are lifelong ties. Leopards, on the other hand, once they leave each other, they pretty much can take or leave each other, so to speak. Um, in fact, they often, even females with, with their daughters, will growl at them. She's going to pop out now. She's coming out. There she goes. Where are you going? Karula, your cub's giving you grey hairs. Another... Oh, she's after that tortoise. <laughs> that poor tortoise. <laughs> It thought it was making a lucky escape, but no such luck. Sharp-eyed Shungile has found it once again. What are you going to do with it, though? You silly thing. You can't do anything. <laughs> I have a feeling if I go all the way around, she's going to lose interest and come all the way back here. And then I'm going to have to start again from scratch. So, Lucy, it depends very much on the animals. Some birds, for example, will mate for life. Um, and some of them, their offspring will stick around for quite a few years to help them and to be raised by them. A jackal will live in family groups, so it is very much dependent on the different types of animals. A cheetah do things all by themselves. Um, they're solitary animals for females, but for males they're in a group or a coalition, and that almost, in, in fact, invariably is a brother, is a, is a group of brothers, or perhaps, where'd she go? Is she, oh, she left the tortoise. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to get up earlier than that to sneak up on your mom, madam. Your brother's one thing, but your mom is a totally different story. She knows you're there. Bounce. <laughs> yeah, you've been well and truly spotted. Even I heard your approach that time.
<laughs> oh. But family bonds for now, uh, Lucy, within leopards are a wonderful thing to see. Yay! <laughs> Yay, Impala! <laughs> Mom, I love you, but also I, I really love this Impala that you got me. Thank you. Imagining, imagining, just imagine what a fantastic time those guests are having with these leopards. <laughs> but yes, the bonds between a female leopard and her cubs are very, very strong. They have to be, um, because they, they have to, she has to leave them for days at a time and then come back and find them whenever she's caught them food. And they are, for the first few months of their lives, completely reliant upon her. Bonds between siblings are not as strong. Obviously, they, they, they make for useful play dates or play, um, play buddies while mom is away and to practice pouncing and chasing and stalking. But once the leopards do go their separate ways, then there is very little in the way of connection anymore. With some limited exceptions, of course. She's still watching the, you can see in Krula's face, she's still watching the Impala. She's not, she's not committed to, to hunting them, she's just keeping an eye on where they are. In the meantime, Shungila, I don't think, has even noticed the Impala. I mean, apart from the one that she has in her mouth. Now where are you taking it? Did you do that just to spite James because he moved? <laughs> you can see her claws, or you could see her dew claw sticking out of its sheath there, gripping the impala. And that claw will be probably, of all of her claws, probably the most important of them. And the dew claw, which is basically the, uh, the animal equivalent of a thumb, or the, uh, not the animal equivalent, the leopard equivalent of a thumb, or lion equivalent of a thumb. Any animal with a paw that has a dew claw. That is their strongest claw, and their biggest claw, and the muscle attachments are phenomenally powerful. And those are the claws that when a lion jumps onto the back of the buffalo, those are the claws that will grab onto it and hold it. Are you planning on eating your dinner anytime soon? Or is it just going to be play date until it cools down? Luckily, Karula has the perfect hoisting tree. I doubt Shogila could get it up there, but Karula certainly can. And so the Impala birthing season, as joyful as it is for us to watch, is also a joyful time for the leopards and the wild dogs, particularly leopards and wild dogs, and cheetah. Go find your brother. Go fetch your brother and bring him back here. No, okay. He's not far, by the way. Um, when Brent found him on foot, he was probably about, I would say, 200 meters, 300. Let's, let's call it 300 meters away from where we are now. So he's not too far away. Bear with me a moment, I'm just going to have a sip of my um, lukewarm water. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could put a tea bag in this bottle of water and have a cup of tea if I wanted. Shungile mm. <laughs> back on the hunt once again. Uh, speaking of lukewarm water, it seems as though Byron apparently, I'm not sure if he's drinking some or if he has arrived at some, let's go and find out. And I wonder just how warm this water is. Uh, we're at Twin Dams at the moment. Uh, I thought we'd maybe have some animals around here, but there's nothing. It seems to be <laughs> the trend for me this afternoon. I'm not sure. Maybe the animals are a bit upset with me for some reason. And they um, 
and they decided to ignore me. Uh, there's a kingfisher, no, two woodland kingfishers just landed in that tree off to the side. That's always nice to see. A little bit lower, a little bit lower. There we go. Oh, wonderful. At least the birds still like me. <laughs> I wonder if they've been bathing a little bit in the water, perhaps. Let's see if they do fly down. Oh. One just flew off completely, and there goes the other one. Well, nice to see the woodland kingfisher, though. Kingfishers. Yo, it is, it is boiling, everyone. I promise you, I can't tell you how hot it is. My shirt's sticking to my arm. It's, <laughs> I'm cooking here. I'm <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> the joys of being in Africa. Africa is not for sissies, as they say. As they say, Africa is definitely not for sissies. <laughs> Maybe they just don't make guides as tough as they used to. I don't know. Perhaps. Rebecca says that is definitely the answer, um, but uh, maybe actually Rebecca you broke up a little bit there. I don't hear what you said <laughs> It's amazing driving past areas and you can remember lion sightings or something that you've seen around in a specific area, leopard sighting, perhaps elephant sighting. I remember, it was not too long ago, about two, two weeks, two and a half weeks ago, right here we had two big male lions from the, um, from the uh, uh, Birmingham Coalition and they were lying right next to us roaring. I'm not sure if some of you viewers remember that. What an incredible sighting. Amazing to have two big male lions roaring so close to you. And it's nice to remember some of the sightings that you had as you're driving around. I know working in an area before this, No, before this, working in an area, I um, I remembered, uh, you know, sightings of leopards in trees and all sorts, and driving around, explaining and showing guests. And it's nice you have those memories. Paul, you wanted to know what the female woodland kingfisher looks like. Almost exactly the same as the male. They're very, very, uh, very little difference, if any. I'll just double check for you, but I don't think there's any sexual dimorphism between the male and female woodland kingfisher. Just make sure I don't drive off the road while I'm doing this. There we go. And um, now there's no there's no sign. There's adult adults. No, there's no difference, Paul. No difference at all between the male and female woodland kingfisher. It's just adults. They look almost identical. Oh, winter prism. Now you've asked an interesting interesting question about the kingfishers and what qualifies a kingfisher to be a kingfisher even if they don't eat fish. So I think it's obviously got to do with um, uh, with the flight pattern, beak structure, uh, you know, the, if you go into the finer details, foot structure, eyesight, all of that. And if you have a look and I'll show you, they all look the same. And actually this might be better if I go here. There we go, here are the kingfishers. I'll have a look at that. So if you have a look, they all have, they also fall under, um, let me just actually double check here, but look at that. And I'm also going to get my book out. It's a, it's a great question, and it's nice to have questions like that. It's high high scene, or what is the word? Give me a second. I need. I'll find that for you. I forgot. The word has evaded me now. Um, there we go. 
Now, some of them, okay, so some of them have got um, a scientific name called Halcyon. And I think those Halcyon kingfishers are ones that have got blue in them, um, blue on the wings, like um, the gray-headed kingfisher. Where is that? Uh, the uh, woodland kingfisher, the gray-headed kingfisher, the mangrove kingfisher, they all have quite a lot of blue in them. And that's a halcyon, fallen halcyon kingfishers, I believe. Then, um, uh, then the the pygmy kingfisher. I mean, is the smallest around, but their beak shape and structure is all exactly the same. And I think that's one of the main factors that make them kingfishers and put them into the category of kingfishers. Um, you also have um, Alcedo uh, kingfisher, also another scientific name, and that's the half collared and the malachite, slightly different. And I think these are ones that these are the ones that do try and catch little fish in that, um, frogs, insects. Um, so they generally around water more. The halcyon ones, I think, are the ones that do also feed on a lot more um, insects. Um, but. Yeah, but it's mainly beak structure, beak structure. All right, so we're going to continue cooking in the heat. And while I do that, let's head back to Jamie, get an update from her. Well, certainly it does feel as though we are cooking in the heat and I think Karula's got the right idea. She's plonked herself on the fallen tree that Shungila tried to hoist that impala kill into earlier. Uh, unfortunately, it is almost time for us to leave the royal family. We're going to be leaving in the next minute or so. We just wanted to grab you back over here just to say a quick farewell to them. Quickly, let's go across Shungila before she moves. Oh, no, she's there. <laughs> Are you going to actually eat your food, Shungile? Yeah, so we will be doing a fireside chat this evening. I know that the um, Wild Earth crew have, or the Wild Earth Twitter page, has put up an announcement about the fact that we will be having a special fireside chat on what is known as white muscle disease, which I can safely say Shungile does not have. Um, she's absolutely alive and well. But we are going to have to start rushing across there to, have to begin our setup. So we're going to have to say a farewell, a fond farewell, um, to Shonkile, who is still playing with her dinner and having a marvellous time doing it. I'm so reluctant to leave, I don't want to drag myself away, but we have to. <laughs> okay. We must go. So bye-bye to Shungile and bye-bye to Karula. Hopefully when we return here tomorrow morning, it, is, it will be to find the two of them in the area and the Impala Kill up in the top of the Jackalberry tree. And we're going to be sending you over to Byron for the last few minutes of the Sunset Safari whilst we go and set up Fireside Chat and we'll see you there. <laughs> Well, what a wonderful sight here, you know, those leopards. I'm glad Jamie got to spend some time there with them and that you got to see them. It's always wonderful to be able to see, excuse me, to see um, leopards interacting like that and to see them with that kill. And as I said, you know, it's all a learning curve for them. Just listen here for a second. Listen to all these cicadas. Very, very loud sound. Oh, I heard an interesting bird behind us. One that we, I haven't heard while I've been here. I'm trying to hear if it's, um, if it's gonna call again. It's the, um, um, oh dear, <laughs> I've been a blank now. Give me a second, I'll tell you what the name is now. I'll explain the call to you. Um, uh, sure, can, I, can you believe it? I've forgotten the name of that bird now. I think perhaps the heat has fried my brain a little bit. It's a, it's a somber green bull, that's what it is, somber green bull, thank goodness, almost thought I was losing it there for a second. And it's got an interesting, interesting call, a wonderful call, I love hearing it. So um, it's described as 
Willie, when I go out to play, you're scared. <laughs> You and so, and so, and it goes. That's exactly how the call sounds. Let's see if I can play it for you, and we'll see how close I am. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> let's see if I got close at all. So somber green bull, um, beautiful, very well. It's uh, not something that you s would expect to see. Very plain looking bird. If you have a look at that, so one of the little browner birds that we get to see. Look at that, somber green bull. But let's listen to the call quickly. And let's see. As I, I explained, I think I was pretty close. Let's see. There's more to the call. There we go, close enough, do you hear that? <laughs> Something like that. There we go, a somber green bull. And I just heard that, the first call we heard, just that quite distinct it's easy to identify and I heard that calling behind us <laughs> oh dear at least the birds are still around for us because of this cloud cover now it's become a lot darker a lot earlier so that's nice, um, makes a change. Might have to get the spotlight out a lot earlier. But um, it's still, you know, I often speak about it, it's that awkward light now where it's not quite dark enough for a spotlight. Also not that light that we can see as well anymore, but uh, it's, fair, it's all, all right for now. We'll see what we can find. Try to see if we can't find a scorpion tonight again. Perhaps, who knows? Sorry, just give me a second. This spotlight seems to be hooked on something here. to know what is my least favorite bird call wow that's a tough question Robbie I've never been asked that before okay VM has one Hardy da yeah yeah Hardy da Hardy da makes a loud noise do you want to give us a Hardy da call VM <laughs> Yeah, pretty, pretty close. They, they do make a lot of noise and it's a loud screech, um, shrill. It's an interesting sound and yeah, it's not a, not a particularly nice call. So I might lean towards that with you, VM, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't mind bird calls. Any bird call is nice for me. Oh, just saw some, a flicker of lightning in the distance off to the left. I really hope it storms tonight. Cool everything down. That would be wonderful. I wonder if we can find a chameleon. That would also be first prize. Trying our best. Oh, and it says it's going to be five degrees cooler tomorrow. So that takes us to about 32 degrees as opposed to 37, which uh, means very little. <laughs> Have a look. I just want to see if you can see some lightning in the distance there. Let's just keep an eye out in that area for a second. Let's see. There we go. There was a little flash there. But there's some beautiful lightning bolts flickering every now and then. There we go. There was an. Oh, I think we are maybe a little bit. Up. There we go. Let's just have a look at from there. I think that should be good. 
Wow, there we go. That's a beautiful strike. You see that? So a lot of lightning in the distance. Yeah, I think that's the right area around there, Vim. But it's still very, very far away. Hopefully it does head this way. That would be great. Let's see. Come on. One more. One more strike. One more beautiful strike for us. Just some flashes in the clouds at the back. Now, um, lightning photography is incredibly difficult. You need tripods and you need to set up the correct settings and it's, it's not easy at all. I do struggle with that at times. There we go, another one, and that's us. <laughs> We're off. But um, nice to see lightning in the distance, but it is very far. I can hear the thunder kind of rolling in a little bit, but it's, it's incredibly far. That's still, we don't have to worry about that for another few hours, that's for sure. Come on, let's see if we can find a scorpion. That's what I'm going to look for quickly for the next few minutes. Mm. Might not be dark enough just yet. Oh, green eyes. You've asked, do we get heat lightning in South Africa? Uh, green eyes, I must admit, and I did geography at school, I've never heard of heat lightning. Uh, if you can maybe explain to me what it is. I've never heard of that before. I've never heard of that term. And as far as I know, the lightning that we've seen is by friction in the air with the, the clouds and the moisture building up and the friction causes the lightning, the electricity, and then that's the lightning we get. I've never heard of anything known as heat lightning. That's interesting. So please do send it to us. Okay, so heat lightning is just the flashes of lightning occasionally in clouds um, really high up and you don't have the follow-up of, of um, thunder afterwards. Okay, so is that what that's called? Yeah, we do get that indeed. At times you do get um, flashes of lightning in the clouds and there was some of that back there. And only those really big f um, uh, flashes that we got, those lightning strikes, those lightning bolts, um, only those those, I think, are the ones that give us some, uh, some um, what's the word, thunder. But there were some other flashes around, and that's most likely the heat lightning that you're referring to. There was no sound to them. And yes, we do get that out here, definitely. It's not always thunder around. Well, you don't always hear the thunder. <laughs> oh dear, so this obviously the word thunder re reminds you of a few songs, mine would probably be thunderstruck, thunder, na 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 <laughs> Rebecca says thunder only happens when it's raining. Now I know some of you might be thinking I've got an incredible voice and I should probably sing rather than James, um, but James gets upset when I sing with him so I won't do that. I'll leave the singing up to James. <laughs> James actually hasn't played guitar or sung, uh, sung for us in a while and um, I'm going to have to have a word for him, uh, with him, because 
and it was always nice to hear James, and I'm not going to tell him this obviously, but it's wonderful to get back and hear James strumming on his guitar and singing a song or two. I do think he is an incredible musician, I, I think he's amazingly talented. And I love, I love his music, I love listening to him play and there's nothing better. Some of my fondest memories when we still worked together was uh, going into the Boma in the evening and that's the area where people generally have dinner in some camps and lodges, sit outside around the fire, just a wonderful atmosphere and then James would sit and um, play guitar for us and sing and just absolutely incredible memories, wonderful, wonderful time. Every now and then, a few of us that work together, there was a group of us, about six of us, four, yeah, five or six of us, and um, we do still try to get together at times. If James and I and the others are all in Johannesburg, perhaps, or if we're out in the bush together, and uh, we do a little bit of that, which is great, great fun. Share stories and laugh, reminisce. No chameleons, oh dear. Or scorpions for that matter. Yeah, but it's too soon to panic. Come on, we need to find one. I can see the lightning in the corner of, me, of my eye. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. You now have that song stuck in my head. <laughs> I wonder if any of our viewers back home were singing along. <laughs> wow, now there's some serious lightning bolts going on in the distance. It's all a good sign. Hopefully, hopefully some rain. Those birds came flying past us. Um, all right, don't forget everyone, Fireside Chat this evening with Jamie and Brent. And um, you can send in and watch and send in your white muscle disease questions. I think they've been preparing that for the last few days and some segments on it. So you can enjoy with them and watch that. Wow, sure, that is serious lightning. It's becoming a lot more frequent. It appears to be getting closer, slowly but surely, hopefully. Just have a look here for a second. Just uh, scan, and I can actually see the rain, it looks like. I want to know, have you ever seen the rain? <laughs> Oh dear, I think the lack of animals and the heat has affected me. I do apologize, everyone. There you can see some of those flashes in the clouds at the top. But let's wait. There's going to be, I'm sure there's going to be one or two serious bolts of lightning fairly soon. Another flash. There we go. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely a lot closer. I love seeing the storms rolling in and the thunder and the lightning coming closer. It is one of my favorite, favorite things to watch out in nature, especially out in the bush. Yeah, do you see that? That is beautiful. Huh. Might even hear some of the thunder. Rolling thunder. Wow. See that? That was incredible. Sure. But it's still very hot, very muggy. 
Um, and sometimes, you know, we do have these storms which build up, build up, and it threatens, and it looks like a rain's on its way, and it misses us. So, not sure if that's going to hit us tonight, but I do hope so. Oh, there's a tree over here. Looked like some sign of elephant, perhaps. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Scorpion time, come on. What have we got? Oh, I thought I had one. Not yet. Not yet, not yet. So only a, a minute or two left before we cross over to Brent and Jamie for the fireside chat this evening. Would be nice to also spot a snake in the tree perhaps. Anyway, from myself and Viam on camera this afternoon, hope you've enjoyed the afternoon. Great to see the leopards. Um, we unfortunately didn't have too much luck, but it was still nice being out here. Thank you very much, everyone. We're going to cross over to Jamie and Brent for the fireside chat. Have a wonderful evening and or day wherever you are. We'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>
Although we thought the first cub was with a broken back, it's probably more than likely disease. Two or three cubs, possibly even four, seem to have gone down with a mysterious disease. That what we probably have here is something called white muscle disease or a variation thereof. Now this is caused by a nutritional deficiency, often brought on by droughts. Now it is not anthropogenic in effect and I'm not sure what the veterinary treatment for something like that would be in a wild population of lions and so the policy of non-interference will be applied. Oh, these cubs are so playful. It's wonderful to see. Now, these little cubs have been struggling with a bit of a, a disease recently, and it was because of a bad drought that we had throughout the, the, the winter months here in Southern Africa. And uh, they seem to have caught a bit of mange as well as a white muscle disease. And I think that's from malnutrition, not eating correctly. It does appear as if they're doing very, very well. All six cubs are here. So that is very good news for us. This is very, very special, everyone. I'm so glad you're... Wow! Gee! <laughs> oh, my... <laughs> oh, isn't this fantastic? There we go. And it looks like, uh, fortunately for us, we only, only lost two of those incredible Inkahumas and, and all of us spend so much time with them and we are invested in them. So, just think, Jamie, what, how did you feel? And, and, and Well, you came up with a sort of very smart reason to why the vitamin E deficiency was... Well, I've, such I've come up with a theory. I haven't come up with a theory. It's not, it's not as it... It's just something, my understanding of the way that vitamin E is absorbed, which is fat-based. So you can't absorb vitamin E without fat in your diet. It's the way that it's transported through the intestine um, membranes and into the lymph system. And my sort of my theory, and it's not it's not confirmed by any of the um, any of the medical officials, the, the vets or anything like that. I'm not a scientist, but my understanding of it is because their diet was so lacking in fat because they were only eating buffalo and the buffalo just didn't have any um, that it, they were struggling to actually absorb vitamin E. And at one point four cubs were missing. Uh, when Taylor was with them the one evening there were, there were only four cubs remaining so it was such a vast enormous relief when there were six and not and not four remaining and then the adults started showing symptoms and there was there were times actually this last few weeks where we were genuinely a bit frightened that it was going to be utterly disastrous for the Nkumas. It, it was indeed, and, and and I know, I mean, everyone here has got lots of opinion on it, and James, uh, you also spent lots of time with them while they were there. Uh, for me, there were three things about this whole thing uh, that we've learned. Firstly, I think Jamie's correct. I think that thing about the fat is very interesting because fat is a limiting nutrient in Africa. None of the ungulates out here uh, develop huge amounts of fat. They don't get fat like sort of grain-fed cattle, which means there's never a lot of fat, which means that their fat is in the bone marrow and in a drought. We know that animals, including human beings, will use the fat in their bone marrows to manufacture energy. So I think it's a brilliant thought from Jamie. The other thing, of course, is that it's selenium. Uh, vitamin E is required for selenium. So on the other side of the, the fat issue, once the vitamin E is gone and can't be moved by the fat, selenium is missing. Now selenium is a very important micronutrient that has a huge amount to do with immuno um, sort of response. And so without selenium, well then there's an ir 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 already an enormous problem with, um, with disease. But for me, there are two other very interesting things. The first thing is that we all jump to conclusions all the time. And um, that, that goes, that. That goes for thought, all of us, absolutely all of us. Um, and uh, dare I say it for some of you too. I mean, we all do it because we love to know what's going on. We theorize here, we throw out ideas and uh, we come to wild suppositions, some of which, and we have to do that because without that, great ideas wouldn't come around. But we do do that and let's, let's acknowledge that. And secondly, how resilient these animals are. There were great calls from a huge number of people to put them down, put them out of their misery, wipe the pride out, take them all out and inoculate them, give them vitamin B shots and E shots and selenium shots. We lost two. That was very sad. But we've got the rest of them fine now. And their resilience is just, for me, uh, quite astounding. Absolutely. And I think on that theme, I mean, with, with the sticks, cubs and the mange, and the fact that the sticks, cubs, mm -hmm. all eight of them, um, didn't make it. Yeah. One, admittedly, it was, it was an elephant-related death, as yeah. far as I can tell. But all of the um, all of the thinkumas have kicked the mange 
yeah, from what we've yeah. seen, they're recovering. Yeah. They look a bit scruffy, now but other than a, that, they're healthy. We've got yeah. a question from Polly, and I'm going to give this one to James. Uh, so, with white muscle disease, uh, does the death come from dehydration? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't want to suppose after what I've just said. <laughs> but, but what I will say to you is that it's it's possible, but that lion cubs don't often have to drink. You know, they get a huge amount of water from their suckling that they do with their mothers. Um, obviously, a lion that is immobile is not going to suckle. The mothers are not very good at lying there and making sure that they feed their cubs. So, yes, di dehydration would have been a factor, I think. But I think the major factor, I mean, whatever's causing that paralysis in the back and in the muscles is eventually going to affect the heart probably and the ability of the diaphragm to breathe in and out. It's a bit like a neurotoxic venom, I suppose. So I would suspect it's probably either heart attack or respir failure, yeah. Yeah, respiratory failure. And especially with little cubs, it's going yeah. into shock. Yeah. Yeah, that's also true. And, and, and I mean, exposed to the elements that that one cub was sitting out in the yeah. sun and uh, just... And in the rain. And in the rain. So yeah. that hot and cold could also ha have, yeah. have done. Cold snaps kill animals really quickly mm. okay so we've got oh sorry i'm i'm, I'm, I'm like not new james james is this I'm, I'm this is my first time being king of the tent <laughs> so um let me have a look there uh, we're just looking at some for, questions for now everybody jamie uh, <laughs> diane from texas uh, has been trying to read up on on white muscle disease and so i'm looking away uh, and it's it is very, very extremely rare in wild animals and specifically in 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 cats and, and lions. Uh, have we ever heard of it being found in, in other lions or whatnot in the area? I mean, Diana, if you did what we did, which was scour uh, the internet for many mm. articles on any kind of information about free roaming lions with white muscle disease, you'll know as well as we do how rare it is. Um, there was the reason that it was triggered, uh, the question of it being white muscle disease, was actually the fact that where were those lions in Mabat? Mabat, so just yeah, Mabat, uh, just a little bit to the north of us, that they had white muscle disease or had just been showing symptoms of white muscle disease. <laughs> and obviously, with wildlife vets around here, you don't just necessarily treat wildlife you often end up treating cattle because it's a it's a it's a deficiency there we go there's the word it's a deficiency that's far more common in livestock than it is mm. in wild animals so this is a completely unusual situation and it was very just that's what i think was made it so scary we couldn't find out anything we couldn't research we didn't know what the survival rates were we just didn't know mm. what was going to happen and with, as with Lindsay's next question, you say, what causes the paralysis? We don't know. We don't know what it, what causes it. it. I mean, to us, it looked like a broken vertebra. The animals went paralyzed from sort of the, where the thoracic spine joins into the cervical spine. They went, they went pa paralyzed. Oh, sorry, the lumbar spine right at the back. Was that some kind of severing? Was it just a, a malfunctioning of the nerves? As far as I'm, my understanding on some of the reading I did, it, it's basically very similar to muscular dystrophy. So the, the muscles start atrophying and almost disappearing. Mm. And so there's no muscle strength yeah. left. And, and from so what it's I, a strength it's issue, a strength it's not of, neurological. No, it's not, and, and but, but from what I read, it's amazing from in domestic animals, it's literally boom, and within mm. two hours, just that, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it yeah. works really quickly. Yeah. And that's that's quite interesting because we did for the with two or three probably about a week before that, I remember looking at one or two of those cubs and saying they've got very fat bellies, but they look very hippie at the back. And they must obviously were getting that dystro yeah. the dystrophy or atrophy of the muscles there. In I the remember back. you saying that and at the mm. time we just looked all oh, they're going through that yeah. gangly teenage yeah. phase. Yeah. Oh. And anyway, um, Kathy, welcome to the fireside chat this Sunday evening. You wanted to know, do we know which, um, which cubs were the ones that died? As far as I know, it were two of the ones from the youngest litter, from what I can tell. And the remaining surviving member was the one with the, the little female with the floppy ear. That's as far as I can tell, but I'm not 100% sure. I actually still haven't seen the Nkumas mm. in a way that I can come. I've, all the times I've encountered the Nkuma cubs, they've been asleep. Which is, it's great to see the clip of them playing. I mean, mm -hmm. I, that cub pounce with Byron was just phenomenal. But I haven't had them, I've had them sleeping. So I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure about what um, sex ratio we're left with for the I'm cubs either. either. Uh, I don't I, know either. I um, thought I saw another teddy yesterday, but I, I could well be wrong. Oh, no, you could be I just think, but right. I just think that they're getting to such it's similar so sizes much. that it's it almost impossible difficult. to tell. It is yeah. difficult. Yeah. Another question we, we, we actually had quite a bit of um, out in drivers, why weren't Karula and Hosanna and Shangile 
uh, affected with the, the white muscle disease like the lions. Well, it, as you've, you've said, Michael, it's, it's a lot to do with their diet. So I think she has a much more varied diet. And you must mm. remember they also, when we're not with them, they're eating monitor lizards and squirrels. So she's got a much more varied diet. Uh, the buffalo were one of the hardest hit by that drought. So mm. they utilized every ounce of fat they had just to stay alive. Where the, and also, you must remember, they're quite Catholic in their diet. They're, they're after the grass. They will eat leaves sometimes, but their diet isn't very varied, and they've had to travel massive distances between water and grazing, whereas the leopard's diet has not only made up a buffalo, except if you're a very big male like Anderson, but it's been very varied, so I think they've managed to get the fat. Mm. I would agree with that completely, and I think the mm. buffalo was softer with digesting their fat. Yeah, I mean, leopards are eating spiders and termites, termites and, and yeah. fish sometimes, of course, a very good source of oil and selenium in many cases. So I think they, they're they fine, and they certainly didn't ever look like that sort of gangly, no. um, no, miserable look at all. They looked very happy yeah. throughout the day. They still look happy, yeah. everybody. They looked so yeah. happy yeah. this yeah. afternoon. Especially because they saw the killer mm. in foot. I think that made crew list. I think it probably did, indeed. Well, On that happy note, <laughs> very happy note. Yeah, uh, it's good. To, it's, we're happy to say the Nkumas seem to be recovering. They are alive and well, bouncing and, about. Yeah, bouncing yes. about. And it's time for us to to say goodbye. Say goodbye. Yes. Goodbye, and everybody. <laughs> we will see you in the morning. Yes. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, Great bye. to have you with us. And it's uh, five o'clock tomorrow morning. Five Don't be late. Five, five o'clock tomorrow morning. See you then. <laughs> <laughs> Hot enough, Brian. Yes, <laughs>